you and special welcome to any visitors who may be worshipping with us. We are very glad to have you all this morning. We'll be taking coffee as usual after the service. Please come along and have a cup of tea or coffee. There are um, intimations on the sheet and also on the screen. Uh, so some of them are running. Uh, three happy things we need to uh, uh, give thanks to God. Uh, for the uh, first thing, you know, being a wife, you oh, really like, just, just only turned 91, <laughs> and she celebrated her birthday. That's a wonderful uh, thing to see people still uh, praising God uh, as um, they go along and celebrate the occasions. And then another happy thing that may have noticed uh, is um, one for young people has become a professional, I think. Played for the first time, first team, Dean, Dean Watson. So we give thanks to God for his uh, continuing success and we pray that he uh, continue to, to experience his grace and uh, more success in the future. And then, of course, uh, one of the things uh, that you may have noticed and read in your newspapers or somewhere on Facebook or something, um, Dave Campbell, our own Dave Campbell, has accepted his calling for uh, some significant contribution to make in the national life of the church. And we give thanks, Dave. If you don't know, Dave has accepted the position of Chief Officer um, of Church of Scotland in 21 George Street. And so he will be making a significant contribution in the life of the National Church. So we give praise to God that He uses people uh, uh, whenever He wants and uh, wherever He wants. So give thanks to God and pray for Dave as he uh, seeks to honor God in that position. If you have anything else that you want us to mention and uh, uh, want other people to pray for you, happy things or things that you really are concerned about it, do let us know, do let us know, uh, 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 and we can also either put on the screen uh, with your consent, or uh, we can pray for uh, these things. So please keep that in mind. Uh, there's no other intimations to make, so let us worship God. Our call to worship is taken from the book of Psalms, and uh, Marla's going to read that, followed by the prayer. To you, Lord, I offer my prayer. In you, my God, I trust. <coughs> Save me from the shame of defeat. Don't let my enemies gloat over me. Defeat does not come to those who trust in you, but to those who are quick to rebel against you. Teach me your ways, O oh Lord. Make them known to me. Teach me to live according to your truth, for you are my God who saves me. I will always trust in you. And we'll continue in prayer. Heavenly Father, who loves each and every one of us, light a flame of love in our hearts for you today. For our families and friends, our neighbours, our work colleagues, and anyone we meet along the way, you even ask us to love our enemies, and that can be difficult at times. As we come together to worship and praise you as a church family, light that flame in our hearts now. We humbly ask for your forgiveness if we have been cruel with our words and thoughtless in our actions, or if we appear indifferent to the sadness and many needy situations that surround us in our world. Be generous, Lord, and forgive us if we have fallen short in any of these areas. Help us to listen for your words as we praise you together in our service of worship this morning. Help us all to know and see that we are always forgiven and free to begin again with your love given through our loving Lord Jesus and Saviour. Amen. Let us worship God. Our first pen uh, is taken from uh, Mission Place 147. And it says, fill your hearts with joy. And gladness. Let us stand together if we are able to and sing.
How are you? Okay? Now, can you name the games that involve balls? Can you name any games? Yes? Okay. Let's see. How many of you can name any games? Football, that's right. I have a few balls here, though. Look at this. Just to give you some idea, right? I have this. Basketball? Any, any other game? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Football, somebody has named. I have this too. Any, anything else? Netball? Netball, yes. Kind of thing. Yes, any other? Volleyball. Volleyball, yes, volleyball. Tennis. Oh, Paul has one. Snooker. Snooker, yes. <laughs> I like that. Any, any, anything else? Any other thing? Rugby. Rugby, yeah, that's somebody said rugby ball. Yes, yes, that's very nice. Yes. Very nice. Any, any, any other? Yes? Sorry? Ten. Ten. Okay. Golf. Golf. Yeah, that's right. What about sports? Cricket. Cricket. That's my favorite. Look at that. Squash. Yeah. What about table tennis? No. I wonder if you are good at catching balls. Shall we try one? No? Let's see. He's good at that. Probably this is much harder. Okay, there you go. Yeah, well done. Who is good at that? Okay, let's see if you can catch this. Wow, fantastic. That's super. How about this? How about driving the back? Oh, here. Huh? Yeah, okay. Wow. You on this side? Yes, okay. Be careful, okay? There you go. Let's see. Oh, Fantastic. Well, there are many, many games that are involved, involved as we have heard. What is the secret? of catching the ball. Can somebody tell me one very important rule or secret to catch the ball? Anyway, keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> Absolutely, that is the basic and fundamental rule to keep your eyes on the ball. The moment you miss, take your eyes away, you can never be caught. And that's important, especially with cricket. If you don't keep your eyes on the ball, that can really teach you a very lifelong lesson. Huh? And same with tennis, perhaps. And other balls too. Now I think that's, I think if we keep that rule in mind, I think we'll do very well in life. Well, because that's, that's the principle of rule that Peter, one of Jesus' friends, learned in a hard way. Now what they what happened was Jesus and his friends were very tired and Jesus said to his friends, okay, you go on the other side of the lake, right? And I will join you later on. So as they got on the boat, boat started moving, there was a big storm. So much so that the boat was filled with water and all the friends were so afraid they were trying hard to take the boat on the other side so hard they were worried about their own lives and then they suddenly saw somebody walking in the dark walking on the water towards them and then they were even more afraid they thought that was perhaps a ghost or something and as this figure came closer, they realized it was Jesus. And so one of his friends, Peter, said, can I come? 
Unless we all do some things together. He was taking a huge risk. And Jesus said, okay, come. And so he stepped out of his boat and started walking on the water. He was looking at Jesus as he walked. But along the way, he took his eye off Jesus, tried to look on the water, and he began to drown and sink. And so he was crying for help. And Jesus, in the midst of his kind of misery and difficulty, Jesus pulled his hand and saved him. And I think that's, that's why I say the principle if we can learn in catching the ball, keeping our eyes on the ball, keeping our eyes on Jesus as Jesus did learn later on, that would save us quite a bit. And I think this is what the Bible says in the he letter of Hebrews, this is what it says. Um, it says, Let us run with determination the race that lies before us. Let us keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom our faith depends from beginning to end. That's the principle. Because if we can keep our eyes on Jesus, and we come across many difficulties, sometimes we take risks, and then we find out that's difficult, Keep your eyes on Jesus. It is at that time that he can come and help us. So, don't be afraid of taking risks, but always keep your eyes on Jesus so you can catch. Okay? Can you do that? All right. Let's not say together. Be bold, be strong. Can you get that, please? There you go. Yeah, who's going to throw? Have all of all right. <laughs> okay. There's another one. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, got it. <laughs> Don't get us in together. All right. Called I am has sent me to you. 
tell the Israelites that I, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, have sent you to them. <laughs> this is my name forever. This is what all future generations are to call me. <coughs> Go and gather the leaders of Israel together and tell them that I, the Lord, the God of their ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, appear to, them, to, appear to you. Tell them that I have come to them and have seen what the Egyptians are doing to them. I have decided that I will bring them out of Egypt, where they are being treated cruelly, and will take them to a rich and fertile land. The land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jeb Jebusites. My people will listen to what you say to them. Then you must go with the leaders of Israel to the king of Egypt and say to them, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has revealed himself to us. Now allow us to travel for three days into the desert to offer sacrifices to the Lord, our God. I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless he is forced to do so. But I will use my power and I will punish Egypt by doing terrifying things here. After that, he will let you go. I will make the Egyptians respect you, so that when my people leave, they will not go empty-handed. I mean, God bless the reading of his holy word. Just before we reflect uh, on the verses, let us sing together, be still for the presence of the Lord. Bible uh, for uh, 
perhaps two reasons. Either we aspire to be like them or we identify with them for what they went through. <coughs> when I was young, I used to like David, Samson, Samuel, and so on and so forth. But as I'm getting older by the day, I tend to like Jacob and Moses more than the others. You know, last week we looked at Moses about, uh, and we talked about how Moses' failure was keeping him from being excited by the prospect of what God was asking him to do. And I do think that failure can have a significant uh, impact or effect on our life and the way we live life after that particular event. For some, it separates them from people. A separation from people lets people or someone reaches out and gets so close that then they start asking questions. There are many people who are afraid of that stage to come where people begin to take the liberty and ask the question, now tell me who you are, where, where do you come from, what do you do, what is your background, and of that. Then there's another aspect. This is kind of keeping peop uh, yourself away from people. But there is another deep down issue that we face after failure is that, and I think that's even more uh, kind of concerning, and that is that people separate or se are separated from themselves. Perhaps they can't find the job that they want and they are landed in a job that they don't really want, but they have to do it because the bills have to be paid. Or they have certain expectations that never come to fruition. <coughs> Perhaps they feel a failure as, a, as, a, as parents, and deep down, there is a sense of guilt or shame. And most of all, some people are absolutely convinced that they have not only let people down, but they have let them go. I think Moses went through some of it, if not at all, uh, not all of it that I have just described. And so, desert provided him a, a safe haven, a place where, can, where he can be himself, he can be alone, and nobody's out there to ask these searching questions. Well settled, trying to get uh, on with life uh, and forget the old and put that old behind. Now he is living an ordinary life. We are told he was tending the flock. Attending the flock for us means tending our own business, our own lives, our own families, taking care of our jobs, perhaps entrepreneurship. We want to be entrepreneur. You're thinking about education, wealth, health, all sorts of things. In other words, tending the cares of the world. And so Moses was occupied with his father-in-law's business. He was not working for himself, he was working for someone else. And I'm pretty sure that he was working in a job or abandoned in a job that he never envisaged to do. Now think about it. He was the prince one of the princes of Egypt spent 40 years of his earlier life among the elites and people were doing things for him without him lifting a finger and now he is here in the desert tending someone else's sheep Anyway, he, he, he spent his valuable and usable time in the desert without being worried about someone finding out about him. Remember, he was under death abhorrent. He had murdered somebody and the king wanted to kill him. 
And so in this lonely place, the God turns up. And God calls Moses to go back to, to Pharaoh, lead the Israelites out of their miserable slavery and lead them to the land of the promise. The, the, the land that God had promised many, many years ago. A land full of opportunities. And another calls, and I mentioned last week uh, about Jeremiah. There are other people too. When God came to them and asked them to do something for him, their first reaction was no, resistance. And so Moses resists the call and raises uh, some of his own concerns or, you know, talked about his own reservations. And I'm going to talk about two of his reservations and we too we will talk about next week. Here is the first one. When God asks him, come and I'm going to send you to Egypt, Moses' reaction is, I am nobody. I am not up to it. It is interesting, isn't it? That this first excuse, in fact, is a white lie. It's not true at all. Let me just explain it. When it says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Moses is saying something that is not true. He is reluctant to take on the role that God is asking him to take on. But really, who else is better than Moses. Think about it. His dual identity seems to make him the perfect person to con con confront fail. As a prince, he was well versed in royal politics and also royal system, <coughs> Egyptian system. What is more, despite his reluctance and his own earlier misguided interventions, Moses is driven by a deep sense of justice. <coughs> and when he sees injustice taking place, he doesn't only talk about it, he, he gets his hands dirty. He gets involved. And he has the courage to defend the victim. In other words, he was a sensitive man who had a heart for the for the poor, for despised and the hated. To my, to my mind, that's enough of a qualification. And so God asks him, "Come, you go to the you go to the Pharaoh," and he says, "No." What is at stake here? What is uh, you know deep down there? I think it's a matter of his own identity. He's suffering with identity crisis. This is what failure does sometimes. It knocks out your confidence and it brings this doubtful ideas in your mind about your own identity. You lose your confidence and I'm sure we all do that at some point in life. It happens to us more than we dare to confess. And dare I say, especially among men. Failure of the past can knock down our own identity, our own confidence, <coughs> our own desire to do something out of the ordinary. And it is right there when God appears and says what he said to George Campbell Morgan. How many of you know George Campbell Morgan? Have you ever heard his name? Okay, let me tell you something about him. George Campbell Morgan was a very famous, a very prolific writer, preacher, and teacher in England. 
he left his teaching profession when he was 23 and he sought to become a minister in, in the Methodist Church. He was among the 150 young men who sought to, to enter into ministry back in 1888. He passed the doctrinal examination, but one more assignment he had to do. He had to preach in, in front of people and in front of the examiners. And so the date was set and he was to preach in an auditorium where, you know, a thousand, a thousand people can sit. But there were three examiners, three <coughs> ministers, and some 70 people or 75 people who came to listen to him. And so George Campbell Morgan stepped up and he started preaching. And he messed it up. He came short. And so two weeks later, he gets the letter. He was among the 105 people who had failed their assignment. The examiners rejected his application after his, this trial sermon. And that was really painful. It was hurtful. Because Cameron Morgan started preaching when he was 10. In later years, Morgan said this. He said, God said to me in the weeks of this loneliness and darkness that followed, I want us to hear this too. He said to Campbell Morgan, I want you to cease making plans for yourself and let me plan for you. Cease making plans for yourself. Let me plan your life. And this is what God was saying to Moses. Yes, you made a plan yourself 40 years ago, but let me now make a plan for you, for you. And you know what, Campbell, George Campbell Morgan was ordained two years later, and he was in ministry for 55 years. His fame, you know, he was such that in America, he preached all over America. He has written many books. Two. Let me plan for you. God is saying. But that has not convinced Moses. Moses says on, and then he goes to the second uh, reservation, he says, in, in effect, I don't know enough. I'm not really qualified. And I was still not, you know. It, is seeing the point that God is making. He's not going to take this job on to free the people who are oppressed, who are slaves. And to be honest, who would take that job on? It was a mammoth task. And I think I can understand why Moses was saying this. Because he was saying this on the grounds of his own seeming insignificance. You don't think he is important enough to take this job on. Moses is asking a legitimate question, I have to say. Now, you know, you don't just simply go to Egypt telling the Israelites that God of their ancestor has appeared to him and he asked me to free you from slavery without at least a name to go on. You know what Moses was trying to say when he was saying to, him, to God, look, people are going to ask me questions and I will be able to answer these questions. God's answer is, in verse 14, it says, I am who I am. But wait a minute. Moses gets a further note. Not, that's not, not only this part of the, the answer. He further gets this information that 
when he goes to Pharaoh, he is not going to believe him. He's going to have this opposition because greed and lust for power, greed of the tyrant is hard to break. Now, when you get this information right in the beginning of starting a job, how many of us will have a, a real confidence to take that job? And if somebody says, no, look, you will have a great opposition from outside and inside. You put that on your church resume or something when you advertise for a, a or something, and I'll, play, I'll, I'll see how many turn up. So God is saying to him, these are the things going to happen, and Moses is afraid, and he says, no, I am not qualified enough. And that comes early in our Christian life, and it follows us all the way sometimes. Moses is using an excuse that so many of us use. He's saying, people will ask me questions, and what if I don't have the answer? Lord, if I take the job, I will not have all the answers. What then? And God says again, I am who I am. I will be with you. What does that mean? God is saying, Moses, you may not have all the answers, but you have all of me. I will be with you. You know, there will be times in our life we will not have all the answers, don't we? People will ask us questions that we will not be able to answer. That sounds very familiar to me. Over the years I've heard this many, many times. Not only people will realize that we don't have all the answers, they will also realize that we are humans. <coughs> but we don't know everything. And you see this passage from Exodus not simply a recounting of an old event, some time way back in history by remembering by participating what God did for Israel in Egypt we see how the pattern of God's action in history point toward the ultimate cross shaped exodus from the power and slavery of sin you see here how I lament on the fact that people have so little interest in the Old Testament and they tell me they don't read the Old Testament. There's so much illiteracy about this first part of scriptures. And yet we can see ourselves right there. You see, through Christ, we as Christians are gracious, graciously grafted into this grand story of slave freeing, promise keeping God. And it is this God who promised to be with Moses and Israel is promising us to be with us too. Emmanuel. God with us. I will be with you to the ends of the earth, said Jesus, didn't he? So, you know, you may be called to be a teacher or a mechanic or a salesperson or an executive in a, in a business or to be at home mom. But even in that, God still calls you to do <coughs> more for Him. He calls you to make Him known. That is the job that He wants us to do. He calls you to do what someone else has done for you. We have, wouldn't have been sitting here if somebody else had not told us about God, about Christ. Tell people about Him. 
whatever the reason, whatever the reservations we may have, be it like, or you know, be it uh, uh, like you know, somebody says, I don't have enough time, I don't have skills. <coughs> you see, God does not expect you to serve out of your own inherent abilities. As Moses, this kind of reluctant person, uh, learned from God that this is not about him, it is about him. You see, did you notice in this story, and you will notice also, the, the, the dialogue as it goes on, God is saying, I will send you, I will be with you, I will make this happen. <coughs> Moses on the other side keeps saying, but I can't, but I can't. You see the difference in focus? God is trying to take his focus on himself. He's keeping his focus on himself. <coughs> He's not lifting his eyes from himself, fixing his eyes on God and on his ability. He's focusing, focusing on his inability rather than focusing on God's ability. You see, God does not give us tasks and then expects us to figure out how we do it with our own ability or with our own uh, 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 kind of a qualification or education. Rather, He provides everything we need to serve Him. And He provides most of all His spirit. Did Jesus say, when I go up, I'll send you his second helper, and he will remind you all the things that I have taught you. Peter says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as God uh, has given you by his grace. God gives us spiritual gift to serve the body of Christ, the church. As people, and we cannot do that which with our own natural ability or capability. And this is why Peter, who, who was frequently so quick in doing things and saying things, realized on the on the day of Pentecost. But it's not about his ability, but rather his ability. And he preached. Thousands of people came to Christ. And so in summary, let's, let me say this. God's call on Moses' life was to let God make plans for him. And this means to push him beyond his own little comfort zone. His own kind of world that he had created for himself. And he's alone tending the sheep. Sheep don't ask questions, do they? He learned about servanthood, a real servanthood, the depths of it. And servanthood, let me tell you, is uncomfortable. It requires putting your own needs aside for someone else. As in putting your own <coughs> self behind. Thinking about others first. It is humbling, thankless, and hard. Tell me about it. Not only is it hard, but the act of serving can also be inconvenient and interrupt our own purposes and our own plans. This is what God is saying. And this is exactly what Jesus did emptying himself and he was so obedient said Paul there was that he was ready to go to the cross and give his life for all of us <coughs> he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death and so let me just finish with this few questions. What is stopping us to respond to God's calling? What is he, what he is calling to you to do for him in the first place? <coughs> now he may be calling you for quite
sometimes we are reluctant and have our own reservations and putting that all aside. Thinking about our ability rather than thinking about his ability. Are we thinking you don't have the qualifications? George Campbell more than never went to any Bible college. Do you think you don't have the answers to all the questions that people might ask? If you are in that kind of boat, you are in a good company. Join the club. <coughs> well, listen to this once again. God is saying, stop ceasing and making plans for yourself. Let me make plans for you. May God enable us to understand what he's asking us to do. Amen. we bring these gifts before you and we ask you to bless them as we say in Jesus' name, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those sins and us. Save us from the time of trial. Let us now conclude our service this morning uh, and uh, respond to God's call. Who is on the Lord's society? We should place number 769. <coughs>